Welcome. Uh, my name is Bob Manukin, and I chair the program on negotiation. And we're here today to learn from and honor uh, uh, a great negotiator. We're here, of course, to honor President Marty uh, Atasari for uh, the remarkable work he's done uh, in terms of uh, diplomacy uh, and negotiation. There's much to learn from him. The two people who are really responsible for all of this uh, today are, of course, our co-chairs, uh, Nicholas Burns and James Sabanius. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to them. Nick? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasure to welcome all of you here. I am really honored that the Kennedy School of Government has joined, I think for the first time, this program on negotiation to honor our great negotiator, President Matti Atasari of Finland. And uh, today you're going to have three. You'll have an opportunity to talk to the President about two very substantial impressive, and I would say quite historic negotiations. The independence negotiations of Kosovo, which took place between 2005 and 2008, and of course the negotiations over Aceh. But first let me introduce um, the panel of experts in front of us. Professor Deepak Malhotra of Harvard Business School, Professor Jim Sabanius, who has been in the lead of this program for a very long time of Harvard Business School, Professor Eileen Babbitt, of the Tufts University Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. That leaves the two gentlemen in between. Um, Ambassador Frank Wisner uh, was the American diplomatic representative, special emissary of President Bush and Secretary Condi Rice, who participated on behalf of the United States in the negotiations leading to Kosovo's independence. And we invited Ambassador Wisner here today so that he could give his testimony as to why this negotiation uh, is worthy of our discussion and study and, and, and how we went from a period of great international division in 2005 and 6 to Kosovo independence with some international division still in 2008. But of course our guest of honor is President Atasari. And uh, I guess it was Jim nine or ten months ago the program on negotiation decided that this year we wanted to, uh, to honor President Atasari. He is one of the world's leading statesmen, former president of Finland, instrumental in seeing Finland go into the European Union, instrumental in the negotiations on behalf of the UN over, over Namibia, in Aceh, in Kosovo, and many others. He's someone who throughout his career has long believed in negotiation and in diplomacy as a primary vehicle for statecraft and for international behavior. And of course, as all of you know, was awarded the 2008 Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his long efforts over many decades as a leading international negotiator and statesman. So it's a great, great honor for us to welcome him here. And before we do anything else, why don't we all just give him a welcome. <laughs> so with that, by way of introduction, I'm going to cast the first question, and then I'll be seated. But President Atasari, Marty, if I may, yes, please. Um, when, you were, when you were given this heavy responsibility by Kofi Annan, what was your ultimate objective for these negotiations? Did you believe that a negotiated settlement was possible? And if not, how were you going to bring this situation to a peaceful conclusion if the two couldn't agree at the table? I made first the rounds in, in, the, in the region. I went to Belgrade, Pristina, from Vienna, and, and visited also uh, Macedonia and Albania. And then already I told my interlocutors in Belgrade and Pristina that uh, I think the final outcome is going to be independence. I was not received terribly well in Belgrade, and Prime Minister Kostunica didn't like what I was saying. But I thought that it would be fair to tell him where I thought that the process would be going. I decided then in January to, I suggested to the contact group that when we were planning to meet in the end of 31st of January in London, that I would propose 
so-called private messages, which I always carry with me. I, I have one piece of paper here, eight points, which I presented to the foreign ministers who happened to be in London. Because I wanted the contact group members to send a very clear signal to Pristina and to Belgrade and to Kosovo Serbs what was the basis of our talks, where were we heading, so that there would be no misunderstanding on that. And there are eight points. The first one is perhaps the most crucial one. The unconstitutional abolition of Kosovo's autonomy in 1989 and the ensuing tragic events resulting in the international administration of Kosovo have led to a situation in which a return of Kosovo to Belgrade's rule is not a viable option. This was told by everyone except Russia to these three parties that I had during the first, first quarter of, of, of uh, 2006. And I have another piece of evidence here uh, from Financial Times on the 14th of March, when Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, had visited London and, and Washington, there was this sort of message in Financial Times. It came from London and, and Washington. Russia and China have told the U.S. that they will not block the independence of Kosovo, the breakaway Serbian province, according to the Western diplomats. Condoleezza Rice, the U.S. Secretary General, discussed the issue with Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister in Washington, last week and was told Moscow would not stand in the way of independence. The official said, Russia and China would probably abstain in a proposed U.N. resolution that would grant independence. This was March 14, 2006. So that was the climate where we started. First of all, I, I think that when you get an assignment like I did in November, I would not have accepted if I didn't have the major governments backing me in the contact group. Because you can't do these things alone. I think it's utter nonsense to think that you are so marvelous that you can solve all the world problems. Because in everywhere where I have been, in a different situations, in Namibia, I had again there a contact group which consisted of, of an unholy alliance, as I called it, uh, South Africans, uh, Russians, Cubans. Uh, I was there for the UN, and then we had the Americans uh, in that group. So this is the, how we started the process. If you allow me, I would simply say that then we spent half a year nearly seeing what should be the protection mechanisms for minorities in, in Kosovo. Because it was important for Serbs and other minorities to know that in our plan, which we work out with my excellent team, uh, uh, they were perhaps the best protection mechanisms for minorities and human rights ever put on a piece of paper. And uh, that was something that the Kosovo Albanians accepted. But I don't want to go any further, otherwise I'll be speaking here the rest of the day. And well, we have lots of questions, uh, Marty. And, yes, uh, go ahead. One that comes to mind, and I had a chance to interview for our diplomacy project, President Natasar, this morning. <laughs> for our website, I asked him the following question, which came out of our faculty discussion of 10 days ago. Mm. Were you a mediator between the Kosovo Albanians and the Serb government, or were you a negotiator? Or are those two words, <laughs> are those meaningless words in your diplomatic lexicon? No, I was a special envoy of the Secretary General. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My task was to find a solution for them. You can, you can debate what title you want to give me. But, but uh, I, I think the important thing is that, and there perhaps my, my approach deviates from, from some of you, because in all the places where I have been involved, in a major way, and some in a smaller way, like in Northern Ireland. But in Namibia, Aceh, Indonesia, and, and, and Kosovo, I have known from the beginning what the outcome is going to be. Because if you don't 
and make it clear also so that everyone knows where you are coming from. You can waste the rest of your days. We have seen processes in this world. It's nice to have processes which last year after year, but nothing comes out of those. Or then you have a process that lasts four years and, and, and you have a nice, like, like in Atze, there were proximity talks, not even direct talks. And then there was a cessation of hostilities ag agreement which lasted half a year because the monitoring mechanism was wrong. But not only that, but that, that was partly contributing to that. So I think you have to keep in mind where do you want to bring these processes. Sometimes you are luckier that you can, you can actually move much faster than, than, than normally takes place. But I ask everyone when, when you, and I tell that to also the governments and, and those who fund our activities, they should see who gets results. Because it's not so complicated to have processes going on. You can do that for 10 years and, and I don't think anything, it may contribute, it, it, it necessarily does not always do that. Thank you. Yes, uh, President, I'm sorry, just to follow up on that. Um, you said at the beginning that, the, that, that you came in to find a solution, mm -hmm. but the answer was already known. So what was the, so, what was the solution you were seeking? Uh, what was it that you felt you were then doing? Putting aside whether it's mediation, negotiation, et cetera, mm -hmm. if you knew the result, what was this process actually about? Some, some might say cynically that it was really a kind of charade to just put a good face on a result that the U.S. and others were um, imp imposing. No, first of all, you can't blame your own government on that because everybody else was in favor. We had the Brits, the, the French. One of the most positive surprises was to me that the French government was extremely firm on these issues. Germans, Italians, and even Russians cooperated throughout that process. The change took place in the end of that process. But if you have an independence in, in that sort of historical situation that we had in Kosovo, then you had to plan mechanisms that would reassure that those who stayed there, uh, the Kosovo Serbs mainly, but the other minorities as well, that they had a future in Kosovo. Mm -hmm. So that's why we concentrated for half a year to have those guarantees. And also that international com community had to have a role in Kosovo after independence for a while in order to secure that uh, and see and watch that the Kosovars are actually doing what they promised to do. They also knew that if they want independence, they have to behave. So. I think when you look at our plan, it, it gave that security for those who wanted to live in, in, in Kosovo, where the majority uh, were Albanians up to 88, 90%. Can I uh, follow up on that as well? Yeah. Uh, so following on Eileen's question, when you think about that outcome, do you see that as a long-term sustainable peace solution? Or is this something, we're, we're talking about a, a situation where we have people who will fight each other by referencing events that happened 600 years ago. Yeah. And my question is 20 years from now or 50 years from now when one side has not agreed that this is a fair outcome mm -hmm. and if the power uh, balance shifts in another 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, is this gonna look like just yet another longer cessation of hostilities that was imposed on one side? No, I, I was at one stage the chairman of the Bosnia-Herzegovina working group in, in Yugoslav conference in Geneva from uh, 92 to, to late 93. And I was working for Cyrus Vance, who was a special envoy then. Who I, I have very high regard and respect. And then I learned when people came with the maps and said 600 years, this was our territory. And, and I had to, I said, so what? <laughs> Karadzic came with his maps and he promised that when I said that we have to talk about human rights and 
protection of, of, of people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yes, we want to have the best, highest standards in, in, in Europe. I said, should I believe him? Obviously not. But if you ask Kosovo, I, I think the more time goes and, and both uh, uh, Serbia and Kosovo wants to join NATO and EU. I don't think none of them should be allowed to join these organizations before they can live with each other. We already know when Cyprus was brought in that we, we were left with, with a divided island and unsolved question. I think we should have, but that, that was a price for starting the getting Turkey the, the uh, uh, candidate status in 99, when I was still president of my country and in sharing the meetings in, in Finland. Definitely, I think we have mechanisms which we ha have to dare to use in order to, to see to it that. And I, I think EU enlargement as such, I think, have played an important role in starting a change process in these old Many of them have been former communist uh, countries. You don't become democracy overnight. And, and it, it requires a new generation of people. Those who have lived in the, with the old regime, I think it's very difficult to change. And, and elections are only the beginning of these processes. But the more time, the better it will look. We invited uh, Ambassador Frank Wisner to join us today. He was appointed um, the Special Emissary of the United States. And Frank, I thought I'd ask you the following question. Given what President Natasari has just said, um, how did the United States and the other governments work with President Natasari? You weren't in the same negotiating effort, but you were related to it. And did you, in essence, as a negotiator, share the same strategic objective as the United Nations representative from the beginning? Well, I. <clears throat> Categorically, yes. Um, but let me elaborate on that for a moment, Nick. Um, as when I was called forward, and you were instrumental in doing it, it struck me at the time that in addition to everything else you've heard today, the compelling situation in Kosovo itself, the terrible history of human rights abuses, the United Nations process, there was another factor that brought Americans to the table, and that is the breakup of the former Yugoslavia meant that the Balkan southeast, southeastern Europe was torn apart. And until the, div the divisions of southeastern Europe could be settled and legitimized, it was not going to be possible to have a stable southern flank in Europe. Therefore, one critically important reason for us to become involved as Americans was to bring the Kosovar matter to a conclusion, work out borders, whether they were fully accepted by parties or not, but to move the entirety of the Balkans to a new plateau where there could be a chance at defining stable arrangements and thereby permit the United States to remove itself. We had soldiers on the ground in Kosovo. We had obligations to NATO and to our European friends. Remove ourselves in a tactical sense, not a strategic sense, with the outlines of a political outcome. Now that was what powered me as I came to join Marti. But what struck me is exactly what Marti has said to you today and what makes his diplomacy quite extraordinary, and that is his clarity of objective and his flexibility in tactics. 